when we started to talk about the arrangements of property, what is very common for all people is that you have some forms of property that are private, that is owned by one or a very small number of individuals, and then you have other forms of property that are held in common, such that it's owned by nobody with open access to all. In law school, we tend to study the common elements less and the private elements more because the private elements are where you have the voluntary contracts for leases and for hires and for mortgages and so forth. But to understand the full system, you have to see the two parts. How do you know which resources should be common property and which should be private property? To understand how this works, what you have to do is to think about a map. And when you look at the map, you will see parks on the one hand, streets, tunnels, and so forth, and lots of private parts of land. If you have something that's long and skinny, what it does is it allows you to link the activities that take place on separate parcels. But when things are long and thin, it turns out it's very difficult to erect any sensible kinds of structures on them. Uh, so what happens is when we have these rules on the common, and this goes back to Roman law, they are basically open to all, but they may only be used for transportation and passage. Now to have a use of productive unit, what you need to do is to get something that's relatively squarish, so that you could have built a building or a barn or a house or a field upon it. And what you wanted, therefore, is to change the ratio of the perimeter to the area. And you'd like these things to be relatively squarish. So the standard map always reflects that particular element. You see the productive functions on the squares and you see the linking functions as being long and thin. And the way they link together is through the following very simple proposition. Any person who owns a square which is next to a public road or a highway has the right to access on that road. And if you design the network correctly, it means that every person who has private property with access to the road can, by staying on the network, reach every other piece of property that has access to the system. And maps are drawn with those kinds of constraints and questions. One of the interesting features is when you're dealing with land, say, in a town, how do you make a plan for dealing with future development of the roads that link things together? And what one very clever device is, is that the city fathers, they do is they put down a grid, which indicates where the highways are going to go and the small streets are going to go. They let people acquire whatever land they want, but make it clear to them that when the time comes to build the roads and the highways out, any private structure that they have is going to have to be removed. This very clever coordination devices means that people, when they build on their own parts of land, will not build where they think the streets and the highways are going to come. And so by a single device, you could have decentralized acquisition of property on the one hand and a coordinated infrastructure on the other. Mm -hmm.